Good morning, Mr. Matthews here again. Today I'm going to look at the Peterloo Massacre of August 1819. An extraordinary incident in the, in the social history of Britain. And you can see there from the Guardian newspaper, the charge of cavalry on the people of Manchester. These were not regular soldiers. They were members of the local gentry and shopkeepers and the, the, and the sons of mill owners and whatever. Not a huge number of people were killed, but it was still seen as a rather repressive measure, considering that these were peaceful protesters. So let's go slide by slide. And let's explain things. So the period after the war with Napoleon from 1815 to 1819 was a very difficult period. There were high bread prices due to the Corn Laws. The Corn Laws were passed by Parliament, which was dominated by landowners. And the idea was to stop cheap grain, wheat, barley, oats coming into the country to protect the profits and the rents of the landowners and to protect the farmers as well who often rented land from the landowners. Then there was high unemployment. As the economy um, slipped into recession, there were fewer jobs around. And of course, the soldiers and sailors who had fought in the British Army and the Royal Navy during the, the Napoleonic Wars were no longer needed. So they were looking for jobs. So there was a period of high unemployment. Parliament only represented the landed classes, even the middle classes, even the new businessmen, the mill owners of the north of England really didn't feel that they had a proper say in the country. It was dominated by those who owned land. The Tory government under Lord Liverpool was very right wing. It was not prepared to reform at all. It believed that any measure of reform to help the people would result in revolution because in fact Lord Liverpool his proper name was Philip Jenkinson he um, he had been present in Paris at the time of the revolution in the 1790s and he was terrified of social upheaval and, and revolution Well, for those that could find jobs, the conditions were really harsh. Women and children worked for long, long hours in factories and coal mines, and you can see the conditions there. I mean, the, the, the actual um, drawing of the girl who is pulled in the coal truck is actually from a slightly later period, the, the early Victorian period. But in a sense, the conditions would probably have been even worse than that at the time of Peterloo. Um, industrialization itself was a major problem. People who had worked at home, people who had worked as, uh, as skilled workers had lost their jobs and had been replaced by these huge machines. And of course, the, the machine dominated life. And it was harsh. It was hard. And the working classes did not have a good time. So there's there's no question about it that life in Britain was pretty rough. Now, Parliament was not fit for purpose. We're so far away from the idea of democracy. It's really quite laughable. Um, there were there were some areas where ordinary people could vote. As you can see there, you've got the Scot and Lot, the Pot Walloper, and corporations, only members of the local council could vote. But generally speaking, overall, it was it was a completely corrupt system. And if we look at the rotten boroughs, so areas which had once had a big population, say going back to the Middle Ages, they still had an MP, even though hardly anybody lived in those areas. Old Sarum, which was near the city of Salisbury, no people at all, and the landowner was the voter, and that was it. 
then there was then there was the pocket borough uh landowner used his influence to control uh, to control the the voters to elect the candidates of his choice so it was basically in the pocket of some local landowner so if you wanted to uh re reward your nephew or whatever give him a nice present you could actually hand him over the constituency and he could stand as an mp even though nobody had voted for him so it's the lack of any kind of, of representation and it's 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 not just the working class; it's the middle classes as well. Just don't have the right to vote. Now, King George the Third was the king, but he had gone completely insane. He was he was incapable of ruling. He was he was being looked after in Windsor Castle, and he was in a pretty terrible state. So his son, the Prince Regent, who would later become George IV in 1820, following from, from the death of George III, he was basically in charge. He had been Regent since 1811. He was extremely unpopular. He was a patron of the arts, and he did have a, he did have a more attractive side to him, but he was basically overweight. He was drunk. He was chasing women. His his personal behaviour was such that uh, you know he was extremely unpopular amongst uh, amongst many people. Um, he had no sense of duty really. And at the time when people at the time when people were suffering in the country, he was extremely extravagant. He spent huge amounts of public money on his own pleasure. And if you look there. If you look at the cartoon on the left hand side, that's by a man called Gilray, who was a great cartoonist and satirist, and he presents uh, the Prince Regent as an absolute slob. You know, absolutely appalling at a time when people are, are finding it very harsh, are finding life very harsh and, uh, and suffering a good deal. Now, one of the great social critics was a man called William Cobbett. He had served in the army. He had uh, he, he, he had done various jobs, but he regarded the whole system as completely corrupt. He was not he was not revolutionary. He was a bit of a Tory in a way. He believed that there should be a hierarchical society, but his opinion was that it was the duty of of the rich to actually to actually do their duty and to look after the poor and to set an example. And he believed that this, this, this system did not have that element at all. It was completely corrupt from top to bottom. This is a quote from Cobbett. Good government is known from bad government by this infallible test, that under the former the labouring people are well fed and well clothed, and under the latter they are badly fed and badly clothed. So, in other words, if the poor are looked after, if there is a sense of social justice, then you have a healthy society. If the poor are not looked after, if they are suffering, if they are in terrible conditions, then that is an unhealthy society. And Britain was very much an unhealthy society in this period, according to Cobbett. So remember the term old corruption. Samuel Bamford was a weaver and a political radical. A radical is somebody who wanted to change society completely by tearing up the roots. That's where the word radical comes from. It comes from radus, which means which means the roots. You tear up the roots, like you tear up the roots of weeds in a garden. He wanted reform of parliament and the liberation of, of working people. So, so basically he would have he would have wanted working people to have the right to vote. Now that would have been appalling to the eyes, to the thinking of people like Lord Liverpool and the other members of the Tory government, because as far as they were concerned, working people were there to work and not to question anything and not to have any say in the way that, in the way their government was run. Orator Henry Hunt. He was the man who was actually going to be the main speaker at St. Peter's Fields. 
on the 16th of August when the Peterloo massacre took place. He again was a great speaker. He would he would rouse up the people to talk about their liberty. He was uh, he, he was a great believer in people power. And he was on the hit list of the Tory government as being a extremely dangerous figure indeed. So coming back to Lord Liverpool, as I've said, he had witnessed the French Revolution in Paris. He was against any kind of reform. Now, if you if you believe that there should not be any kind of reform, reform, the only thing that you can do to deal with discontent and so forth is repression greater use of the army greater use of the forces at your disposal now there's no police force then that is 10 years down the line to when robert peel set up the metropolitan police force in 1829 and, th and that's only the police force based in london so in a sense if there is civil discontent if there if there are if there are riots on the streets the way you deal with it has to be through the use of the army that's the only thing that you've got and of course the army is much smaller now because you've come to the end of the wars against napoleon napoleon has been defeated at waterloo and the army isn't, isn't, as, isn't as big as it was but whatever army you've got will have to be used against um, ordinary people should the protests get out of control. Now this is a politician who had actually nothing to do with the Peterloo massacre, but he was absolutely hated. Lord Castlereagh came from an Anglo-Irish landed background. And he just had this element of uh, unpopularity that was such that the people hated him. And he was seen as being everything that was wrong with this government that is completely unsympathetic to any kind of reform or, or, or people's or trying to uh, trying to uh, deal with people's problems, and he was so unpopular that later he cut his own throat, so he committed suicide, and that's Lord Castlereagh. But again, he had actually nothing to do with the police Peterloo massacre itself, but he became an object of complete hatred. So, August the 16th, 1819, St. Peter's Fields, Manchester. The people had come to hear Orator Henry Hunt. The authorities wanted him arrested. Now, how many people turned up? There are, there, there are, different, there are different figures. Some would have said 50,000. Some would have said as much as 100,000. It was a big, big demonstration. There's, there's, there's no doubt about that. It was, one, it was one of the biggest demonstrations that had ever happened in British history. Manchester, of course, was then developing into a major manufacturing town, the centre of the cotton industry in Lancashire. So we could say that many of the people who were there to turn up were either mill, owner, uh, mill workers, sorry, some of them might have been unemployed mill workers, others might have been people who were in jobs, but still... These were the working people of Manchester and they'd come to your orator, Henry Hunt. The authorities wanted him arrested. He was very much on a hit list. Now, those who charged, those who made the charge and were responsible for what becomes known as the people of the massacre, were called the yeomanry. Now, let me explain what yeomanry means. These are part-time cavalry soldiers. They're not professional soldiers. They are the sons of local mill owners and gentry. So they would have seen they would have seen the local working class as the enemy, and 
if you can see there uh, in that particular drawing they charge the people with great zeal remember they they were probably armed as if they were regular soldiers and they carried what was called a cavalry saber remember this is only four years after the after the actual battle of waterloo itself so these are i mean they they have the weapons that normal soldiers would have but they were not professional soldiers Now it's called the Peterloo Massacre. This is this is uh, a brilliant piece of irony because it's four years after the great Battle of Waterloo in which Napoleon was defeated by the Duke of Wellington and the Prussians and, and the, the, the long wars against France were brought to an end after the Battle of Waterloo. This is a painting by Lady Elizabeth Butler who was a Victorian artist who painted military subjects and it shows the charge of the Scots Greys, heavy cavalry, at the Battle of Waterloo. Now, of course, it's it it looks extremely heroic. It's it looks, it looks extremely dramatic. It's sometimes confused with the charge of the Light Brigade, but this has got nothing to do with the Light Brigade. This is this is Waterloo, and these are the Scots Greys charging towards the French infantry on them. On, on the morning or I, I would probably say in the early afternoon of the Battle of Waterloo. Now this is heroic. We can say these men are incredibly brave. Many will lose their lives that they are brave soldiers and it's an heroic deed. Now if we contrast that with what will happen what was happening in St Peter's Fields, that is not so heroic. So these cavalrymen are charging unarmed civilians this is not the French army they're charging. These are not Napoleon's veterans. These are ordinary working people who only want uh, a greater say in the government of their country. And so therefore it is sarcastic. This is Peterloo as opposed to Waterloo. So if, if we change it again, if we go back to Waterloo, that's heroic. So change it again to not so heroic so it's the difference between heroism and not heroism cowardliness if you like um attacking those who are powerless what were the casualties of peterloo well it would seem that 18 people were killed so is that really a massacre well it depends how you how you how you define the word massacre it's not a huge loss of life if you if you think of other events similar to this the bloody sundays down in history when the, the, the protests against against the czar's government in 1905 then you would have had hundreds killed so the actual deaths of 18 killed is not that much injured injured 400 to 700 how many of those could have ended up in the end as casualties in terms of death is uncertain but it's not so much the numbers that were killed it's the fact that these were peaceful protesters they were not there to cause a revolution they they, they were not there to overturn the government they were peaceful now there were there were rumors that um men were being drilled that uh, soldiers who had fought in Wellington's army were actually t teaching people how to march and some of them had uh, got hold of muskets. There were all kinds of rumours going around that there could be a social uprising. But there is no evidence that those who turned up in St Peter's Field on that August day were other than peaceful protesters. Now the poet Shelley, Percy Bysshe Shelley, he wrote uh, a poem called The Mask of Anarchy, which was a savage attack on the Tory government for the uh, Peterloo Massacre. And here are two of the verses from the poem, The Mask of Anarchy, which I'll now read to you. Men of England, hairs of, Sorry, men of England, heirs of glory, 
heroes of unwritten story, nurslings of one mighty mother, hopes of her and one another. Rise like lions after slumber in unvanquishable number. Shake your chains to earth like dew, which in sleep had fallen on you. Ea many, they are few. Now those lines, ea many, they are few, Shelley is appealing to the people to realise what power they have. They are the people who do the work. They are the people who uh, uh, basically are in charge of society because they're the ones that actually they actually do the work. Whereas those who, who do not do the work, the ruling classes, they seem to have the power because they control the land and the resources, but there are very few of them. If the working people could come together, if they can unite, if they cannot squabble amongst each other, if they can come together as one as one body, their power is unbelievable. And they can bring about a transformation of society. This didn't happen, but this is what Shelley was saying. Ea many, they are few. In the year after the Peterloo massacre, there was another incident, uh, which was called the Cato Street Conspiracy. A group of radicals led by a man called Arthur Thistlewood attempted to, to, to kill, to kill I've got, uh, that's, that's King, the entire cabinet, that should be killed, sorry, to kill the entire cabinet while they dined at Cato Street, which is a major street in London. Uh, the attempt was foiled and the Cato Street conspirators were imprisoned and many were executed. Now, the Tory government became even more repressive after Peterloo and the six acts were passed. Parliament, in Parliament, laws um, meant to repress political agitation. Every meeting for, for radical reform was an overt act of treasonable conspiracy against the king and his government. Outlawed seditions and blasphemous literature, any attack on religion, any attack on the church was seen as an act of blasphemy. There was a stamp tax on newspapers to increase the price of newspapers to stop people from reading and developing ideas and discussing ideas. The authorities could search into private houses for arms. That would mean magistrates or it could mean soldiers. Remember, there's no police as such then. And there was restrictions on the right to public meetings. So people's freedoms would be taken away from them. And the Tory government had no intention of trying to deal with people's problems in terms of reform. It was purely repression, okay? So finally, what was the influence of the Peterloo Massacre? Well, last year, it was the 200 years since the Peterloo Massacre. And this is a quotation from the Electoral Reform Society. 200 years since one of the first battles of the road, our political structures still need to change. So there is this idea that democracy is an ongoing process. Now, since the time of Peter Lou, everybody has, has, has the right to vote. Um, it, is, it, it is a different system. But the idea that political power is still in the hands of the few rather than the many is still held to be the case. So there we have it, everybody. That is the Peterloo Massacre of 1819. Thank you for listening.